All right. So we're looking at lesson eight, launching the new ship of state. We're going to break this lesson up into two parts. We're covering the presidency of the first five presidents, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. And what I've done is I've just give you a little snapshot of the election and then the key events you need to know. And if you want, you can work as we go through this. You can have your reviews. And if you've got questions along the way, just let me know. So first president, George Washington, elected from Virginia. He's going to set the two-term precedent. He'll be our only president to be unanimously elected. Remember, he is elected through the Electoral College. We'll talk a bit more about the popular vote as we move forward. He's inaugurated in New York City. That's where the original capital was. We'll talk about by the end of his presidency, the capital is going to move from New York to Philly and Philly to D.C., um, Washington, D.C. That's going to be a significant event in his presidency. If you ever have the opportunity to go to New York City, make it happen. Check it out. It, it'll be a trip you won't regret. And if you do go visit, as I've said before, check out Wall Street. And if you visit Wall Street, you'll notice right across uh, for, or out in front of Federal Hall is a statue commemorating Washington's inauguration. His vice president, John Adams, um, and we're going to hit on some of the important events. So event number one would be the creation of the federal court system through the Judiciary Act of 1789. What this does is not only creates a Supreme Court, which had been established through Article Three of the Constitution, but it also creates lower federal courts, and those federal courts are going to exist in, in the states. So everything from local courts through court of appeals to circuit courts and on up the ladder, uh, that foundation was established through not only Article Three of the Constitution, but the Judiciary Act of 1789. Our first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is John Jay, there in the middle left is the U.S. Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. A lot of times we kind of forget about John Jay and John Rutledge and Oliver Ellsworth. Those were our first three chief justices because they served as the first, second, and third in a pretty short period of time. The guy that we really remember is our fourth chief justice from Virginia, John Marshall, who served on the court from 1801 to his death in July of 1835. This is a pretty significant run on the court in any era, not to mention a period of time here where, you know, this predates germ theory and all that, you know, this is uh, not an easy era to live through, live uh, a long life. I'll get to your question in a second. Um, Marshall is going to rule in some of the most landmark decisions that we still live by today. One of those decisions that we're going to talk about is going to be the Marbury versus Madison case that not only establishes the system of judicial review, but it actually amends this Judiciary Act and replaces it with a new Judiciary Act to even further strengthen Article Three of the Constitution. How many justices sit on the Supreme Court? Nine, right? And we're going to, as we move through this lesson and through the rest of the semester, we're going to be talking about some important Marshall cases. And even in next semester, there'll be Marshall cases that have precedent um, for the cases that you ruled in. Ian, what's up, buddy? No, no, they they took on other jobs like. John Jay is going to end up getting in, getting back into foreign diplomacy, serve as minister to Spain. Um, Rutledge is going to. I'm pretty sure Rutledge is. He's going to get back in state politics. And if you wouldn't mind, if y'all wouldn't mind taking a look at Oliver Ellsworth, 
where, where he ends up going after he steps down. But um, no, it, it was it wasn't like a those first years where Justice is sitting on the bench for life. And we'll we'll see throughout um, history. Not every not every justice nor every chief justice is going to sit on the bench for life. A lot of them will. Some of them will actually retire, resign. Um, it's a really great historian and author that I would recommend if you have any interest on the Supreme Court. His name's Jeffrey Tubin. Um, he is an awesome historian of the Supreme Court. Well worth your time. Check him out. Um, I'll recommend some of his books in the second semester. Um, any other questions? All right. So I've been to the, about the creation of a presidential cabinet, uh, not a cabinet for um, China, but a cabinet for advisors, right? So we have on Washington's cabinet of advisors, we have Jefferson, his secretary of state, Hamilton, his secretary of the treasury, in charge of the economic budget and the currency. He's going to be the guy that's pushing for the national banking system. He's also the guy that's pushing for the assumption of state debts. Here we have Henry the Ox Knox, the uh, first secretary of, the, of war. Over here we have Edmund Randolph, uh, the main attorney general. He was also, um, you know, not only lead counsel, but he had been the co-author of the Virginia Plan with James Madison. Uh, the guy that's not um, on in this particular painting is um, the Postmaster General Samuel Osgood. Every year it's like people are like, wait a minute, he's not the first. He's not the first. The first Postmaster General has obviously been Franklin, who was commissioned Postmaster General under the Continental Congress. He is the first Postmaster General in a presidential cabinet, technically the fourth Postmaster General. So if we want to split hairs, which that's fine. I, I appreciate attention to detail. Um, the Bill of Rights, event three, added to the Constitution in 1791, authored by James Madison in 1789, ratified in 1791. This is that compromise that is sort of holds the, the Constitution together and allows the Federalists and the, the Anti-Federalists to come together. You have to know the First Amendment, freedom of speech, press, religion, assembly, and petition. And I just have a really quick, handy-dandy breakdown for you um, on our, our First Ten Amendments that are added to um, the Constitution. So, First Amendment, freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, petition. Second Amendment, right to bear arms. Third Amendment, soldiers can be housed in civilian homes during peacetime. That's in rel relation to what that we already learned about. Quartering, Quartering Act. Very good. Uh, amendment number four, no unreasonable searches or seizures without warrants. Uh, the Fifth Amendment, this is an important one, uh, right to refuse to speak during a civil trial or you plead the Fifth so you don't do what? Incriminate yourself. Good. Um, also in five, due process of law, no double jeopardy, uh, meaning you can't be tried twice for the same offense. Um, article, or sorry, amendment number six, right to a speedy and public trial. Seven, right to a trial by jury when the sum exceeds $20. Um, the eighth amendment, no excessive bails or fines. And then nine, other rights not enumerated or given to the people are also in effect. This is known as the People's Rights Amendment. And then Amendment 10, all unlisted rights belonging to the states that are not enumerated or given. This becomes known as the States' Rights Amendment. So 9 is the People's Rights Amendment, 10 is the States' Rights Amendment. This is a bit of review here. These are statutes that become the foundation of the Bill of Rights, and they are the Virginia Declaration of Rights written by George Mason. This becomes like the, the groundwork um, and blueprint for James Madison's Bill of Rights, re reiterated the notion that basic human rights should not be violated by governments. 
and then Thomas Jefferson's Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom outlawed the established church and the practice of uh, government support for one favorite church. Also, the ability to be its freedom of or from religion and the ability not to have to pay what to an established church? Taxes. Very good. Nice job. Event four. Here we go. We've got the founding of the, the political parties. This is also a little bit of a review. We covered this at the end of lesson seven. So Washington was not about the political party splintering. Um, he did not want to get involved in political factions, hence the reason his uh, small cabinet was diverse and robust in terms of uh, political heavyweights, but also people that definitely did not see eye to eye, right? He put a group of rivals on his cabinet. Um, so with that being said, uh, Jefferson, who would have fallen in line with anti-federalists, remember he's in France while the Constitution is being written, his party is going to become known as the Democratic Republicans. Just to confuse everyone, um, sometimes they refer to themselves as Republicans. Sometimes they'll refer to themselves as Democrats. Eventually, they drop the Republican and just become flat out Democrats. If you're looking for the origin of the Democratic Party, it's pretty much here. It's between the Jeffersonian era and the Jacksonian era. Well, Andrew Jackson that we'll be getting into this. Uh, a bit later. Um, so the Republican Party as we know it, that that comes later on. The Republican Party as we know it, not associated with this first Democratic Republican movement. The uh, Federalists under Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, they are going to be those that are trying to ratify the Constitution. They evolve into a larger political party. They're going to make it till about the late 18 teens, early 1800s. Um, the last of their group are going to be guys like John Marshall, who are still on the court uh, well after their party has dissolved and faded away. We'll talk about the demise of their party as a result of the War of 1812 later in this lesson. Here's the position: the Federalists, created by Hamilton backed by Samuel, or sorry, John Adams, rather. Um, he's one of the other founders of the party, but the leading founder is Hamilton. Favored a strong national government, limits on states' powers, favored industry and internal improvements, more roads, canals, um, favored a national or U.S. banking system that emulated what country's central banking system? Britain, very good, nice job. All right, the British Central Bank. Um, they are mostly from the Middle Atlantic, New England, from more urban areas, uh, back to more free labor, um, more, more in favor of moving away from the slave system. That didn't make them abolitionists by any means. Um, they weren't trying to, they weren't, they, they weren't on the, there were Federalists that were part of the abolitionist cause, but we're still a little ways away from like the full-on abolitionist movement. Around this time, most of the abolitionists were coming out of the Quaker communities. So we'll get, we'll get to that later. The reason I bring up the slave system is because much of the Democratic Republicans came from the South, parts of the West, rural areas in the Middle Atlantic, founded by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Favored strong power to the states like Virginia, favored small business and farming, agriculture, backed the, the um, slave system in the South. One way of remembering this would be Jefferson's little utopian community in his mind of small business and agriculture, right? And the peculiar system of slavery as many Southerners referred to it as. Where would that place be? That Jefferson would have in his mind where he lived. Monticello, right? You've got your agriculture, your nail factory, but you're also making commerce off 
slave trade, right? Um, Jefferson's a bit of a tangled web of contradiction, as we'll understand moving forward. Opposed the creation of the U.S. bank or the national banking system, believe that that was an overreach. This is a bit ironic, too, because as president, he's going to have to use the bank in the United States to fund the Louisiana Purchase and the Corps of Discovery to explore it. He and Madison will agree to assumption of state war debts and the National Bank in in exchange for move, movement of the federal capital from New York to Washington, D.C. So the capital will be moved from New York, it will be in Philadelphia for a short time, and then from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. That takes us to event five, the creation of a new capital in Washington, D.C. Um, there is one person in particular that has a whole lot to gain from this um, movement, and it's Washington. Any ideas why? Washington has a lot to gain with having the capital moved to present-day Washington, D.C. It was not named, it was named after him after his death. Right, right back behind his home, Mount Vernon, right? Not to mention, he owns Foggy Bottom. So he, he has a lot to gain financially for this real estate venture as well. This was hotly debated in Congress, the movement of this capital. Many people believe that this was yet another sort of uh, uh, pacification or um, trying to think of the, the word I want here, an appeasement to the South to move the capital to them. And we also know that this is Washington games a lot here because Washington is involved with much of the planning of the capital. Those that planned and laid out the capital, free African American uh, astronomer and surveyor Benjamin Banneker and French designer and city planner Pierre Lafont, with uh, Washington being a part of the process from everything to uh, city um, development to uh, design of the capital and the executive mansion. He does not ever live in the executive mansion. Um, he will pass away before the executive mansion is completed. He actually leaves office before the executive mansion is completed. And we'll talk a bit about that moving forward. Event six, the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, are you all familiar with what an excise tax is? An excise tax? It's kind of like a tax, it's kind of like a sales tax on a commodity. So there's an excise tax that you all pay or your parents pay all the time and we, we really don't pay attention to it. What's a, what's a product that we use all the time that we rarely pay attention to the tax on? What's that? Food, that's a really that's a good point. Food food sales taxes are typically they they they're a lot of them are like made locally or made, you know, that's that's awesome because we do add commodity taxes on food. That's a really good point. Okay, uh, sometimes you gotta pay a water bill, probably have to pay tax on that water bill. Okay, you all you you, if you pay, if you buy water in a bottle, you're paying a tax on it. Cigarettes is a really good, that's awesome. Tobacco's risk has an excise tax, a sales tax. Gasoline. Gasoline is a commodity. Do we pay a lot of attention to a to gas tax? Not really. We just, I mean, you can kind of shop around for gasoline. Uh, you can kind of shop around for gasoline, but you know whether you're going to go to Costco versus Kroger versus Shell versus whatever. I mean, are you really going to go out of your way? Maybe, 
Hot hands up if you do. Right. Right. Okay. So again, it's not not a lot of us. Maybe maybe sometimes, but do we do it all the time? Probably not. Due to convenience. Okay. So an excise tax was placed upon whiskey, and even though it was a commodity, they didn't see it as a necessity. But what you have to understand is. A guy like Secretary of the Treasury Hamilton, or even a guy like Washington, who was the single largest producer of whiskey in America at this time, the way that they see a whiskey tax is not the way that a farmer in Western Pennsylvania sees a whiskey tax. Because for a Western farmer in Pennsylvania or Virginia or in another rural area of America, they saw whiskey as a commodity that was not only consumed, but it was a commodity that was used as currency for barter, right? So what happens in Western Pennsylvania in this particular rebellion, the tax collector, his house is burned to the ground, he's tarred and feathered, and these people are refusing to pay their taxes. Washington and Hamilton raise an armed force, march on Western Pennsylvania, and they put down the rebellion without having to fire a shot. This is an interesting moment in American history because we already learned that Shays' Rebellion was a moment that, that was a, it was a make or break moment for the Articles of Confederation and it broke the Articles. This rebellion tested the Constitution and the Constitution and Washington's ability to not only lead a military force, but Congress's ability and the United States government's ability to raise an army to enforce and collect taxes, it had proved that the Constitution was stronger than the article. So, pretty important moment early on in American history and an early test to the Constitution. Washington's farewell address, uh, the book that I've talked to you about earlier, um, Joseph J. Ellis's Founding Brothers, a really great chapter in that book, dedicated to Washington's farewell address. After his second term, Washington stepped down and set the two-term precedent. Uh, that precedent will not be broken until uh, FDR was president. So in his uh, farewell address, he warned against the creation of the political party system, the entangling of alliances, with foreign nations that could drag America into foreign wars or lead to foreign invasion of U.S. territory. <clears throat> he talks about neutrality. The Native American question, how would Native Americans be assimilated into American society? Because at this point, Native Americans were completely left out of the Constitution. Domestic and economic stability through interstate and regional trade, not to mention the growth of the American industry. Because what we're what we're at the dawn of right now, as Washington leaves office, we're at the dawn we're in the dawn of the American Industrial Revolution, the first industrial revolution. And then the slavery question, right? How do, how does a democratic republic founded on the principles that all men are created equal, how, do they, how does that, how does the slave system continue? And this is also a bit hypocritical and ironic considering Washington and his wife were slave holders. Much of their slaves are going to be emancipated upon their deaths. Washington set the United States on its feet and made it quite sturdy. The election of 18, or 1796 rather, will lead to the victory of John Adams over Thomas Jefferson. There's no 12th Amendment in place, meaning that the president and vice president run on the same ticket. So if you won, you're president. If you came in second place, you're vice president. 
this creates a great deal of turmoil within Adam's presidency. Is he and Jefferson don't see eye to eye on a lot of the policy. Not to mention foreign policy with what country? France. Very good. France. What you need to realize is that by the time Washington has left office and the time that Adams has entered office, the French Revolution is at a fever pitch. French Revolution begins as Jefferson is leaving as Minister to France to take on the job of Secretary of State. Much of the Democratic Republicans try to hitch their wagon to France, believing that America must support France in their time of need. Not everybody can see out of eye on how are you going to support France, right? Are you going to get behind the Jacobins and get behind Robespierre? Are you going to get behind the Crown? Are you going to get behind the military? It was a nightmare. I mean, we're, we've all learned about the French Revolution. It was a complete mess. That's where Washington steps in and says, eh, we're good. We need to get on our own two feet, and we need to remain neutral. This is going to create a lot of infighting with the Founding Fathers, but it's also going to create a major test for Adams, and it's going to probably, it would be what we would consider Adams' crowning achievement in office, but it spirals into, uh, I'm sorry, I wouldn't say crowning achievement. I would say a series of crowning achievements that spiral into a limit of, of rights that cost Adams re-election. So we're going to take a look at that. Adams is uh, going to be inaugurated in Philadelphia, but he will be the first president to live in the executive mansion in Washington. And it's not Washington as we know it. It's still, the city is still being laid out and built. It's basically the swamps of Foggy Bottom and the Anacostia River. Um, not to mention the fact John Adams and Abigail Adams, his wife, were absolutely appalled by the fact that when they arrived, all of the labor that was being done to build the city and to build the executive mansion was all being done with slave labor. All right, so event one is one of those achievements. It's the X, Y, and Z affair. Uh, as a result of our neutrality, it led to what we would call the quasi-war with France. And the quasi-war is related to the X, Y, Z affair. We had a pitifully weak navy and a pitifully weak merchant marine fleet at this time. Do you all understand what the merchant marine fleet is? Those are the folks that move goods, right? So our merchant marine fleet is suffering at sea. France is going to seize American ships and hold them for ransom. Adams is going to send a diplomatic envoy. An envoy is means like we send um, representatives from our country, diplomats, to try to go and negotiate peace. Our two diplomats are two Virginians, James Monroe and John Marshall. When they meet with this delegation to try to broker peace to regain American ships, the, the uh, French officials only refer to themselves as X, Y, and Z and are, are not going to allow the ships to be released unless the United States pays a high ransom. This is a pivotal moment in American history. What could we have done? Could we have accepted this and paid the ransom? Or could we have gone to war? That's really where we're at at this point. Monroe and Marshall are going to leave France offended, return to the United States, and Congress is on the brink of war with France. John Adams knows that America is in no shape to go to war. We only have a couple of frigates 
that have been launched by this time. Warships. We don't have a navy to fight a global war at sea with France or England or anyone else at this point. So John Adams negotiates a peace treaty in 1800 known as the Treaty of Mortefontaine, and this particular treaty keeps America out of war. There, are, there is some collateral damage. The Federalists become deeply divided. Many members of Adams' cabinet are going to resign in disgust that Adams did not go to war. And as a result of this, Adams is kind of like a man without a party. He's sort of out on his own, but there's, the Federalist factions are, are going to be deeply divided. Another interesting thing about this too is there's so much division between Adams and, and Jefferson. Jefferson packs up all of his stuff and heads back to Monticello and spends the remainder of the of the term at Monticello. So we'll begin a the, the the unraveling of the friendship between Adams and Jefferson, and we're going to talk more about that as a result of the election of 1800. What's up? But this particular event actually divides uh, Adams and Hamilton. The thing that really destroys the friendship between um, Jefferson and Adams is the election of 1800. That's where he hires James Callender to write all the stories about Adams and Hamilton. So like, there's like these manufactured stories of, of Adams being corrupt and being like a monarch and not trusting the people, and he like tries to capitalize on the Alien and Sedition Acts. He also pays James Callender to expose the affair that Hamilton had had with a political rival's wife. Hamilton does the unthinkable. He comes out and says, I did it. I had an affair with my rival's wife. It was the wrong thing to do. And he apologizes for it. He's just honest about it. And, and then Callender, sort of like ironically enough, Callender comes back to, to Jefferson and says, you owe me for these stories that I've written. If you don't pay me, I've got, I've got some stories that I'm going to publish on you. Well, Jefferson was famous for not paying his debts. So he's got this outstanding debt to Callender. He doesn't pay it. Cal he thinks Callender is bluffing. Calendar publishes the Sally Hemings Affairs, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Jefferson had a relationship with one of his slaves, um, Sally Hemings, who was more than a slave, and you know, she was a legitimately his concubine, and uh, she, I mean, she traveled to France with him, she was with him, you know, at Monticello, he was not married, his wife had passed away, but those stories are published, well, Jefferson handles it like the complete opposite way. He just doesn't say anything. You know, people are like, well, what happened? We want to know. Jefferson's like, no, oh, water off a duck's back. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to get into it. So Jefferson has a little to say about the Hemings affairs. And historians are still trying to wade through the history of the Jefferson Hemings affairs. And, you know, it's been. How long now? Over 200 years. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, and that's that's the, uh, so with the DNA studies that have come back, the DNA results, uh, there's clearly children born at Monticello who are Jefferson descendants depends on which Jefferson descendants they are. That makes sense. Um, so that there's a, a historical society dedicated to the African American descendants of the Jefferson family. And they are doing some tremendous 
historical work, um, and they have gotten uh, their descendants have gotten the right to be buried at Monticello in the in the cemetery. Yeah. All right. I told you guys I love political cartoons. Uh, this is uh, a personal favorite. This is uh, the X Y Z affair. So we have uh, French officials plucking at Lady Liberty or Columbia's um, feathered cap here, and her feathered cap, all these feathers represent the 13 states. Here we have French uh, military um, ransacking the American treasury, and then in the back, European officials have their backs turned to America in distress, and here on the hill, laughing is the British foreign minister. So kind of a cool cartoon to break down that era. All right, hang in there with me, guys. We're just going to get through Adam's presidency. We're going to bump the brakes. The Alien and Sedition Acts, this is the downward spiral of, of Adam's presidency. Um, there is fear that there are aliens, illegal aliens coming into the country that are going to stir up problems. These folks are mostly coming in from France and England. They're fearful that French and English immigrants are a threat to American society. After the XYZ affair, it becomes very difficult for English and French um, immigrants to gain citizenship. Um, obviously, this was fodder for Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans to say the Alien Act was a uh, not only in, infringed upon uh, basic rights of the people, but also infringed upon the rights of the states. So they take that and run with it, but what Adams' administration really gives the, the Democratic Republicans, the Jeffersonians, a lot of fodder uh, to use is going to be the Sedition Act, and that is nothing illegal um, or, uh, or liable or scandalous could be written about the government. Well, one of the guys arrested for that is James Callender, another um, newspaper contributor and editor um, by the name of Lyon, L-Y-O-N. He'll be arrested and tried for seditious libel. Um, what does that go against? The First Amendment, right? So the Democratic Republicans are going to run with it, and what it will lead to is Madison and Jefferson's Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. Madison wrote the Virginia resolution. Jefferson wrote the Kentucky resolution. And what these resolutions were, it stressed the idea, and I want everybody to hang in here with me and pay attention. It stressed the idea of the compact theory. This is an, this is an idea that these states freely join the union and they agreed upon concurrent shared powers. And if there was a law infringing upon the powers and rights of the states and the people, then that state should have the right to find that law nullified and void. Okay? So we call that compact theory the states' rights theory, or we call it the nullification theory. This is a really interesting moment in American history because any time we talk about the American Civil War and people say the Civil War had to do with states' rights, this is where we can trace the states' rights argument back to. So I wanted to give you that sort of historical perspective that a lot of the fire eaters and early Confederates that wanted to secede they obviously wanted to protect the slave system, but they were able to point back to the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions and saying that, hey, how can you deny a nullification theory when the men who wrote the Declaration of Independence, the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, the Constitution itself, and the Bill of Rights, when those two men 
we're fully behind the compact theory for states' rights and nullification. How can we deny our own right to secede and break away from the union? So, again, I know that this might be a little bit like, what, what in the world are you talking about, Mr. E? But when we get toward the Civil War, I want to refer back to this. So when the, when the time comes that you're having to wade through the history yourself and you're saying, why, why do we use that state's rights idea? Why is that even a theory that people use when we know so much of the Civil War was fought on the basis of the institution of slavery? It goes back to this, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Any questions about that? All right, I know I've got some uh, um, cadets in the room, and I've got some people that have uh, family tied to the to the United States Navy. Um, so we've got the Naval U.S. Naval Department, founded by Adams. Uh, many call him and John Paul Jones the fathers of the United States Navy. Uh, the Naval Act was founded and formed um, during Washington's presidency. It put into commission the construction of six uh, warships, six frigates, the USS United States, USS President, USS Constellation, USS Chesapeake, USS Congress, and the USS Constitution, Old Ironsides, the first to launch in 1797. If you're ever up in Baltimore, Theater Harbor, I encourage you to visit the Constellation. And if you're ever in Boston, I encourage you to go visit Old Ironsides, the USS Constitution. A couple of cities, well worth your time to go visit. So Adams is responsible for the buildup of the US Naval Department. And the final event, this is where we close out today, the election of 1800. Really great question. A lot of it, this is a horrible mud slinging event. Uh, mud was being slung on all of the major candidates involved. The three major candidates in this race, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Aaron Burr. It also leads to some deep-seated uh, political uh, strife between political rivals, political strife between Adams and Jefferson. It's never really fixed. Uh, they do write some letters later in their life, and oddly enough, they both die on the same day, 50 years to the day of the signing of the uh, Declaration of Independence. Um, the uh, election also pits Aaron Burr and Hamilton against one another. Um, the reason for this, Jefferson and Hamilton actually tie in this election. So Adams is out. Hamilton, did I say Jefferson and Hamilton or Jefferson and Burr? My bad. I meant to say Jefferson and Burr tied. Hamilton puts his support behind Jefferson, which was, in his mind, the lesser of the two evils, which is a little ironic because Hamilton had a far longer standing relationship with Burr than he did with Jefferson. And uh, Jefferson will narrowly win this election. Burr will be vice president. And um, before, the, before his first term is out, uh, Burr will duel with Hamilton and will fatally uh, shoot and wound and ultimately kill Hamilton in the pistol duel on Weehawken Heights. What's really important about this election, this is the first peaceful change of power in American history, meaning that our founding fathers, prior to the election of Jefferson, in the three previous elections, had been Federalists. Now we have a Democratic Republican coming into power. In events prior to this, in an elections prior to this, and in events and in elections after this throughout the world, an election of one governmental group or political party taking control of another could potentially lead to revolution or even civil war. In fact, 
It does happen once in American history, right? The election of 1860, the American Civil War, who's elected president? Lincoln, very good, right? That's the final straw that leads to secession. So this is an important election. Jefferson comes into power. Uh, Burr is his first vice president. And Adams will head back to Massachusetts. Questions for me? All right. This is a good place for us to stop.